Hello and welcome to the satsang. It's lovely to have you here. Um, the uh, the idea of um, satsang is just that we come together and drop all the the nonsense that we usually are involved in. I say nonsense, you know. I mean the the plumery and the and the uh, impressing and the competing and the checking each other out and. Uh, vying for position and all the rest of it, all that will be it. We'd normally do these things quite subtly, but they are intrinsic and part of the kind of uh, herd bonding mechanism. And um, yet, when able to be free of the, should we call it the local self, this this superficial aspects of us that presents to the world through which we present to the world. Um, and uh, the more cognitively we do so, of course, um, the more powerful this, um, what do you call it, this filter that we create is, uh, or rather the more powerful the, the form through which we express becomes. It's uh, when we're lost in the, the artifice and the pretense um, that we lose authenticity, obviously. And then the other will generally go along with it if we do it with enough conviction. I mean, just look at mainstream culture on TV and all the rest of it. Fox News, for example. Um, not that I'm singling that out. There's been particularly uh, a particular exemplar of utter rubbish, but it's a good one, a good example of it. And people will buy it, but then what happens is, is that you diminish the whole human experience to one of, of, of fakery, and, and that's fairly endemic in our in our culture. Um, we, through meditation, and by that I, I mean in the broadest sense, the um, training ourselves to be cognitive of what is occurring moment by moment, by in the, certainly in the Taoist system, by remaining body-centered, by referencing the experience of the moment to your what's called your proprioceptive senses, your ability to feel what is occurring within your skin and specifically, and this is particular to the Taoist practice, this facility for coming into the back and bearing witness to the experience of you being you and all the others responding or reacting to you being you, you observe it all and experience it all from the back of you. And then what makes that um, feasible in terms of remaining connected to the continuum of life in a meaningful and fulfilling way is learning to open the heart in the front of you. Because when you do open the heart correctly, you open up a, um, a stream uh, through which energy passes both up and down the connection um, from the heart. And this energy, heart chi, is, is love. Without any of the stories attached to it, that is the essence of of love. So then we find that we're connecting on what you might want to call the soul level, you know, from the profound level of ourselves. And by continuing to practice this flowing backwards, as the Taoists call it, we experience after a while the sense that the presence that sits in the back and bears witness is far larger than what fits in the physical body, far larger than what the intellect can grok as, a, as an entity. And in fact, when continuing the process, it seems that this presence that watches from the back is limitless, it's so big. In which case, um, it's not a difficult jump to make to see how that presence is the presence, as in that which informs the world of matter from the subatomic level, uh, which, uh, you know, in talking in enlightened terms as opposed to religious terms, we could call God, we could call it Tao. It doesn't really matter at all what we call it because it's only names for something that is too vast and huge to even describe. And when the presence in us communes through us, to the presence in another or in others, something occurs which in modern, the modern vernacular we call synergy. 
which is an exponentially multiplied energy. You could just call it magic if you wanted to. And uh, I theme these, uh, or have been theming these satsangs for I think we've been doing it for four years or so now, over four years. Um, we group them in six and give each one a theme, just because it helps focus the mind. Um, I'm not totally enamoured of that anymore. I'm excited to get the feeling it would be really fun just to have a whole raft of topics and just see where the Tao wants it to go that week. Um, as it's happening, I think Sue Ducrew probably will balk at that idea, but that's where I'm kind of veering towards it. But nonetheless, um, this confident communication theme is interesting for me because it brings up so many issues and um, then specifying each week what we'll apply that confident communication to somehow makes it quite challenging. And the idea that you'll have uh, a mission of some kind, a message, a gift, an idea. It could be a passing idea, something that will be just something that will, you know, could happen over a period of a year or a month or a day. Um, or it could be a big, 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 big huge uh, project that you're working on. And or it could be um, presenting something to somebody that would be for their good because you're trying to help them and you can see that they have a blind spot to that. Um, and uh, it could be a way of explaining to your fellows how if we all did it a different way, we'd all benefit by this, then let's give this a go. So this is an interesting topic, and the basic theme, however, this, the subtext to it all, is that when we do learn to be in this meditative state, so that we're observing ourselves going through our lives, bearing witness to ourselves going through the, the theatre of life with each other, we're observing our responses to it, therefore we're not reacting, most of the time anyway, we're, we're responding calmly. Um, the presence is what is communicating through us and the idea that we have is our best version of interpreting in our interpretation of what the presence is wanting to communicate through us and as artists because that's what we all are, our, our lives are, are art forms that we're creating as we go along um, our part is actually to develop the crafts uh, aspects of it, the craftsmanship, the expertise in discerning the message that's trying to come through clearly without putting too much clamp on it, but not too much coloration, but just enough to make it appealing um, and to give it enough shape and form for it to have cohesion and therefore congruence with the world around. And there will be times where that skill, well, I mean, as you develop, it's obvious you can get better at that, not in a straight line, nothing progresses in a straight line, it goes in spirals, so it feels a bit like a waltz motif, you go forwards and then you go backwards and you go forwards and you go backwards, so gradually you're getting closer to the, uh, well, what are you getting closer to, really, growing into the fullness of self, really. And um, the, the knowing that the Tao, the great flow of things, has its own mind in a sense, it has its own will in a sense, um, it knows what it needs to do, it, it naturally does that, it's not that it sits around thinking about it, it's not a person obviously, it spontaneously bursts into whatever it needs to burst into and, and it knows what it wants so to speak and therefore if we have an idea that we want to impress upon somebody or impress somebody with there has to be the awareness that it really doesn't matter if they buy it or they don't buy it because if the Tao wants them to buy it, they'll buy it. If it doesn't, they won't. That doesn't mean the idea is wrong, it just means that the crafting of it needs more time or that they weren't quite ready to react or respond to it yet. It might be that it will take time for it to come back round and for it to percolate. And you know the old adage that if you let somebody think it's their idea, they'll generally go for it, well it may be it takes time for them to make it their own and then come back to you with, a, with, a, with enthusiasm. Um, but the grace that comes with not needing your version to be the one 
knowing that your goal is to constantly be a channel for the Tao, constantly be a channel for the, the grace of the Tao, and to know that by doing your best at being at all times with an open heart, sitting in the back of you, remembering always that your fellows are Tao in human form, so you're serving Tao like, with them in a way, or for them, through them, on their behalf, on its behalf, if some words anyway, so, um, the Tao, or the flow of events, will take care of you without you having to be greedy or grasping about whether your view as you're seeing it is the right one or not. In other words, it doesn't matter anyway. It's all just a game, if you like. And as long as you do it with an open heart, with good intent, the game will take care of you and things will evolve and they'll always, it seems, come to a place where you'll stop and look and go, wow, this is exactly the setup that I had intended all those months, years or whatever ago. And now it's happened and I actually didn't even notice it doing that. And it doesn't look like what I'd imagine it was going to look back then, but then I didn't have all the information back then. I see how clever the Tao is. And uh, I think that's the basis of this, the theme today. It brings to mind, uh, in my work, I, I'll tell you my mission, because I want to I wanna impress something on you today that I think is for all of our good. I'm going to use that as an example. And uh, I've always been with this. It, it occurred to me at a very, very young age that what's going on in the world now uh, was inevitable. I didn't foresee what it would exactly look like, but I kind of knew it was coming to this and kind of where this looks like it's going to. Um, and if my, I don't, but it's for me, I'm not into protesting and demonstrations and stuff. I have no judgment about it either way. If someone feels to do that, then they do that. My, my way is not that. It's to, and I chose this very early on, or it, it, it was given to me that I would meet people who have influence and, and power to make changes occur and I would be able to influence in a positive way over time those people and that would be one way of, of, uh, of doing something to help things get steered in a direction that would be harmonious for everybody. I, I say that without any grandiosity. That's part of the work, the, the main part of the work is helping everybody um, be able to heal themselves, because that's what I'm teaching essentially, at the deepest level. So anyway, I, I, as part of that whole thing, I happened to have been uh, asked to go and work in Monaco, uh, you know, Monte Carlo for a while, which as you may not know is, is one of the world's uh, tax havens where super wealthy people have homes and don't necessarily live there all the time, I think most of them don't, but they come and go a lot and they generally have the top of the line private jets at Nice Airport. I'm going to talk about the 12 seater ones or whatever, not just the little ones. And they have the helicopters to bring them from there to, to Monaco and so on and so forth. And they drive around in their ridiculous supercars in traffic jams of supercars and uh, look miserable standing on their yachts and all the rest of it. However, I was invited to go work there and I did some really quite amazing work specifically on a tiny little two-year-old girl who'd been diagnosed autistic and was about to be hurled into a lifelong of, uh, of being autistic, basically, and treated like that. And I, I don't believe in diseases. I don't believe in conditions. I don't believe in autism. I don't believe in any of that. It's the way I'm trained. That's how I can help people, because if I believed in it, I couldn't. I see people, I see a condition of energy, and I work with that. I see the presence in them. I talk to that, and I did that with this little girl. And the week after I treated her, um, she was pronounced no longer autistic by the doctors. And that word spread very fast amongst some other things I did. And so I would be invited to various dinner parties. And um, uh, very, very, very interesting because what I would say, this is one I'm, and then, well, I'll just tell you, it always has the same format. There will be the most powerful man, and it will be a man generally. Yeah, in fact, looking back, it always was a man, yeah. Um, who would be making sure that, i.e. the richest man, eh, would make sure that somehow or other everybody in the group knew that he was the boss. So it was that he established his prime primacy. 
And this took about 10 minutes usually. Obviously, it wasn't overtly spoken about. They could have done it in one second if they'd spoken about it, of course, but it wasn't done like that. And I'm finding myself, and I'm me not, I mean, I'm not in that game. It's obvious I'm not um, in, this, in, in the contest there. Uh, I'm sort of like some curiosity, a bit like some weird holy man, a weird modern holy man, um, kind of a bit like maybe like Rasputin, you know, or something like that. It's kind of an interesting guy to have at your dinner table, kind of as a status symbol, actually, because um, apparently you're famous too, aren't you? You know, and all that nonsense. And um, I was there at this, I get invited to a super yacht, to a super dinner of super people, of super rich people. And the main guy, who happened also to be the most handsome and well built and richest by far, whose yacht it was, um, was throwing the party. And I was sitting between him, as I recall, who's at the head of the table, and uh, whose levels of hubris were so big that you could have kind of floated on them in the air. But it was all right, nice guy, not like horrible or anything. And the guy next to me, to my left, was the second richest guy <laughs> on the boat. And he was, um, he lived in Monaco, and he was English, and he was, uh, he didn't seem to have been particularly well educated. He was, Sound like he came from the East End of London, so I like you talk like that a bit, you know. And um, he uh, uh, must have been very talented at what he did, which was international massive property de real estate development. And um, you know, he obviously had come up with some angle. You know, he seemed like a nice enough guy. So I, I felt for him because he'd quite clearly been put in second place and was feeling it. Even after all his work and the money he'd earned, he still was only in second place. I felt for the guy. And um, I started talking to him about things, trying to um, open up a conversation. And in my quest as to kind of bring sense and balance, as I see it, on behalf of the Tao, whenever I'm with anyone, really, but like certainly if I'm around people where they you know, got influenced in a big way, I started talking, this was about three years ago, I started talking about the state of things and um, the disparity between the people with wealth and the people without and how that was growing rather alarmingly in fact and how nature has its own way of rebalancing things and that it would be quite inevitable if it continued like this that there would be, and there was talk of, and still is, revolution of some kind. And it never fails to happen throughout history whenever the balance goes too far, uh, out of balance rather. And, um, and which he conceded was true, uh, at some level anyway, in an abstract sense. Um, and I said, so do, do you think that it would be prudent, uh, let alone humane <laughs> to start focusing on how one could start to share it out somehow to let it circulate a little bit more freely and fairly just a little bit not to be a lot not so it would be punishing for him or anyone like him but just to make sure that you take care of all your brothers and sisters at least enough that they're not going to be that angry with you that they're going to come and you know, topple your ivory tower and, and, and bring an end to you. At least that would make sense to me if I was in that position. And um, he listened to me and his eyes glazed over. I said, what do you reckon? And you'll have to excuse my language here. I quote him. He goes, fuck him. Exactly in that tone. And I was shocked, actually. I have to confess. I, I felt that in my mission to spread good basic decency that I was sure anybody could agree with more or less that he had like punched me in the side of the plexus with his reply it was so brutal and cold and self-serving and incredibly short-sighted and narrow-minded and somehow redolent of the fact that he no doubt has an island somewhere all stacked up with food ready to go and helicopters to get in there so he doesn't worry about anything that goes on in the world anyway or that kind of thing that kind of he had that look in his eye because they will do anyway, you know. and uh, and I said, but look, man, I mean, okay, I could get you, you. You're objectivistic, and I'm sure that's why you're so successful. And my hat off to you, sir. 
But what I'm saying is, is that we are a family here on the planet. And I mean, you like everybody in the family, I and mean, most people don't like people in their family, we know that. But they're your family, and we've got to look after each other, because if we don't, we'll start going at each other, which is already starting to happen. And if we succumb to that and get into this horrible going at each other thing and dividing into clans smaller and smaller and everybody fighting each other, well, I don't need to spell it out to you, do I? So I'm sure, really, there must be something that could be done, don't you think? And he just goes, fuck them. <laughs> I laughed, I had to laugh just like that at that time. It was partly laughing directly at him, of what an idiot you are. But also laughing at his ridiculous confidence, which isn't real confidence at all. That's just, I don't know what that is, it's completely ignorant. Um, and, 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 and just laughing at the absurdity of it all. And that he was the Tao as well, you see, that's what really made me laugh. Um, now, I didn't succeed. Uh, at that point, and it didn't feel like a failure at all. Well, it did actually. It, it did actually. Now I'm being honest with myself. It did. I felt like I failed the Dow, but then I felt quite soon after that when somebody came up to me and she said, "I really like what you were saying before." <coughs> Excuse me to that guy. It made a lot of sense. Um, so you know, in, in other words, it wasn't it wasn't a failure. It was how interesting how the Dow works. And that wasn't for me, you know, that wasn't for me directly, although well, it is ultimately, of course. I, I want to live in a view, you know, I love this planet, I really love being here with everybody. I want to keep going on, you know, kind of like it is, except make it fairer, that's all. Um, but, but it was very interesting watching how the Tao gets its job done, in other words. And it's not for us to uh, worry about how we're being judged by the other. All we have to do is focus on serving the Tao and then let the Tao decide what happens. It's a really fun game. So that's the gist of what I'm going to help us activate today through a meditative process shortly coming. Now I want to present you the idea because this pertinence to meditation um, as an example um, that the more you embody the method that we're going to be using, the easier it is for you to communicate well um, and the method is about getting you to embody the Tao. Because when you embody the Tao, you can't be stopped simply because the Tao is limitless. So how can you? Um, part of it is that you learn, and this is a metaphor, to flow like water, never piling up or going stagnant. Be as humble as a raindrop, yet potentially as mighty as a tsunami. This is all traditional Taoist, by the way, I'm not making it up, or like this is my interpretation. Um, you learn to intend something to occur. When intention, which they call e, the e, um, is focused, they say it is as strong a force as steel. However, not to be steely or kind of metallic in your approach, very soft like water, as I say. You learn to stick, they call it sticking, like a like you're sticking with a magnet rather than glue or anything gloopy, and you're not gripping on, you're just sticking with the middle of your palm, as it were, to what you want, to the idea of what you want, um, with four ounces of pressure. That means uh, not hard enough to be considered brutal or be physically influencing things, but not soft enough as to be namby pamby. So the optimal pressure through which you can feel your connection with the flow of events without pushing it, but just having your intention for it to move in a harmonious way. And you learn to yield to oncoming op opposing force, which is inevitable on your journey. You, like I got met with that with this guy, you learn to yield to it without losing your ground. That means you swivel, as it were, from the hips and the force goes past you but you're still standing there ready to come back with the next sticking bit. Um, and you learn to retain, uh, not, no, none of this is, is uh, uh, theoretical or abstract, these are actual techniques, uh, contemplations. You learn to retain perspective and, and therefore keep things in proportion. 
In other words, it doesn't matter. None of it matters. I mean, even if it was the end of the world, that the other guy didn't get your thing, that, even that doesn't matter ultimately. It's just the end of the world. There are plenty more worlds. Oh, you could say everything matters, of course. But the idea that, that the Tao will have its way, and that is all that is important, um, not that you are proven right. And you learn to see others, the other, as the Tao in disguise, just as you learn to see yourself as that. And you learn to see yourself merely as a channel of Tao expressing itself here, presumably just for the sake of the theatre of it all. This is the Tao's entertainment, all this theatre of life. So if you think about what lies behind your intention, in other words, behind the need to get the other or the others to buy your vision. Um, in my case, the other example I gave, uh, it, it's that I'm living in a world. So rather, yeah, you could say that the intention was to get this guy to go, hey man, that's nice, I'm glad I've met you tonight. Yeah, uh, you've actually woken me up um, and reminded me I'm a human being and I've got my fellows I need to look after here. Tell you what, let's set up a foundation, I'll stick in five billion and that will take care of all the whatever it is. Yeah, that would have been, you'd have thought would be the intention. Actually, um, my intention is that I am living in a world of kindly people, enjoying being here and having fun. All of us having fun together, figuring out how to stop this vehicle crashing. Because that's what I think we should be doing right now. Um, so then I stick to that intention with four ounces and just let the Tao work through me without investing in what I'm seeing happening in my mind, being what will happen. In other words, it doesn't matter. I have to be humble enough to know that the Tao knows what's going to happen. I, I, it's not for me to decide. In presenting um, your idea to anybody, you're entertaining them, which means literally you're holding the space between you. So right now I'm presenting the idea of, of the, uh, the whole Taoist um, approach and in doing so I'm entertaining you and that means not that I'm da -da 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 -da. it means that I'm holding the space between us. I'm taking responsibility for this space being beautiful and nurturing for you and for everyone here and we happen to be here from all over the world right now and what a beautiful coming together this is. So I'm just presenting a vision as you will be doing far more easily after this meditation um, and um, all you do, all the other is expected to do is I, you know, at, at best just go with it and see what happens. So I'm not going to explain the, um, the method, I'm just going to do it with you. Take a moment to have this moment for yourself. So go to yourself, this is my moment, I'm having this. And um, pardon the dogs barking, every week there's something, this week it's dogs barking. There are never, ever dogs anywhere near the hideout today, there are dogs, just now. So I guess the dog has something to say, the Tao is talking through it. Um, I personally would like the dog to be quiet, but there seems to be more than one now. And what can we do? The dog, the Tao is a dog, the Tao is dog. So yeah, take this, oh thank you doggies, take this moment to um, own the space, like to lay claim to being in your body, sitting where your body is sitting. Lay claim to it, this is your kingdom or your queendom. And get a sense of your physicality, the skeletal system, the muscular system, all the connective tissue that binds the muscles to the bones through the ligaments, tendons, and so on. The, uh, the, the, thing, the, the tissue that binds the organs to the muscles and so on, or you know, gives them their space to sit in. Um, the fluids moving through you, the nerve impulses moving backwards and forwards and um, lay claim to this, it's only temporary, it's the vehicle, bless it, 
and notice the breathing that's going on in it. It's very, very clever. Um, the belly rises and the air comes in. The belly falls and the air goes out. Now the incoming air is the next moment of life for you. In other words, the in-breath is life for you, for everyone. The outgoing breath is your bit, it's your sacrifice, if you like, your gift to the Tao. You're saying, here, thanks for that last minute, have it. It's beautiful, it was beautiful, thank you. And then you're emptying, you, the lungs can take air in again. That happens on its own autonomically. The lungs breathe in and the air comes in and brings you the next moment of life, blessed be. And then your part is to let the belly fall, or if you like, pull it back to your spine and that pushes the air out again, that's your gift. And when you are breathing in, actually it's like the Tao is breathing out into you. And when you're breathing out, it's actually like the Tao is breathing in and drawing the air out of you. And the air is bringing you life, so bless the breath, bless the air. And become aware of the muscles of your body, which through uh, mental trauma that remains unresolved or occurs on a chronic basis without you even noticing, you adopt posture which becomes a holding pattern and the muscles contract in a certain way and remain like that and that's why you often see old people walking along hunched over and um, or, you know lopsided and what have you or if you look more carefully you'll see all people of all ages uh, in that state really uh, one way or another and uh, it's because we hold the painful memories that we haven't released in the muscles and the soft tissue. So imagine, which is actually true, that you have the power to issue an edict in the kingdom or queendom which says all muscles and soft tissue in this realm will henceforth remain free of old, stuck, toxic memories and will now forevermore grow softer more pliant, more resilient, juicier, and more youthful and springy with every breath I take. And um, notice your muscles thanking you. It's subtle, but you can feel it all over the body, the back of your neck. Say, oh, thank you. You've released me. And the muscles under the armpits, oh, thank you. The upper arms and the forearms, oh, oh thank you. The hands, thank you. The thighs and the, the hamstrings are going, thank you. The calves and the shins, thank you. The feet, the soles, the toes, thank you. And your lower belly, thank you. And the back, all up and down the back, thank you. And your face, thank you. And all the muscles are very grateful because you've let them go. You've stopped squeezing them and causing them that pain. And they've become softer immediately and will continue to do so. You have issued the edict. And now become aware of your skeleton, primarily the, the spine, which is the central column, the central support of your whole structure. And you'll notice how crumpled it is, how compressed unnecessarily, as if you've got the weight of ages pushing down on the top of your head and compressing it. And actually, you must now give the edict to the spine to elongate like a snake unfurling from its basket to the tones of the snake charmers, Shenai. And um, get the feeling of the crown of your head, very gently and discreetly, but nonetheless purposefully urging its way upwards towards the ceiling or sky. Notice how that elongates the back of your neck. And immediately when that happens, your eyes, your mind, everything feels lighter because you are actually taking in more protons through your eyelids or eyeballs if your eyes are open because the head's more upright so there's more, more light coming in and um, aside from what it's doing to your central nervous system and then the shoulders which tend to be held up near the ears as a protective device a bogus one of that, are free to drop let the shoulders drop let the weight of the life story go learn to carry it let it go. And the shoulders can broaden now. So you can have a breadth across your chest, which enables you to feel more love, more joy of being here. And the heat and the turmoil of the mind 
doesn't have to be that way at all. It can drop down all that heat, all the weight of that heat, all that energy can drop down and through the belly, through the legs, and return to the earth where it belongs. All the, the interference, um, the weight of the head, the shoulders, the upper body can drop down because the crown of the head is urging upwards, so you're not going to keel over. So you just let all the weight drop and all the fizz drop, and now you feel grounded and you're breathing slowly, and your spine is elongated, your shoulders are broad. Just raise your breastbone a little bit without arching your back, just to give the feeling of rising up to all that is beautiful. And all your muscles are softening and softening and softening rather than tightening and hardening. So you're growing more towards life rather than death. And now, the big manoeuvre. So rather than be jammed up in the front of your body everywhere forwards of the side seams of your t-shirt or garment of any kind where you are then enmeshed with the noise of your conflicting emotions in the solar plexus and the noise of the conflicting voices in the front of your brain your prefrontal lobes where you only have the front of an experience and it's a very confusing place to be lost in the world of the 10,000 things Instead, be like the king or the queen, be like the grand master now, and sit back inside. That means you put yourself behind the side seams, so that you're filling up your back. And to help you do this, just visualize that you are breathing in through the whole of the front of your body, face and throat at the same time, through all the pores of the skin. A wall of air, beautiful air, beautiful clear mountain air into the back of you, everywhere behind the side seams. And the actual imaginary cool sensation of that in your back makes you be in your back. Then as you breathe out, you breathe out that same wall of air through all of the front of you simultaneously. And that movement forwards of the breath has the reverse effect of thrusting you back even further into your back, just like when taking off in the plane and you keep doing that breathing in and breathing out and both breaths pushing you into your back further and further and don't let your physical back be a boundary anymore so just let yourself keep flowing backwards and backwards through inner space really through an, another bigger dimension noting that the presence that is now becoming palpable as you um, is huge, large, 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 becoming more so the more you take off the uh, filters that you've placed on it with your conscious mind. So allow yourself now to be universal in size, no limits, no end to you. And it's huge what you are, the whole phenomenon of being here, being this is huge. There are no words for it. And this is the source of all creation, what is back here. This is where it all comes from. What happens in the front is where creation plays itself out for you, so that you get to experience it as the Tao through this form called you. And all around you, to start with here, in our circle, there are people from all around the world, beautiful people, who are doing exactly the same thing. So there is a sense that all of us in our backs are communing as one big universal presence that somehow very cleverly manages to squeeze itself through these holographic forms, um, and each one different, how clever, to amuse itself because if it made us all have the same face, it would be obvious that there was only one presence here it would get bored. What would be the point of creating the game in the first place? So it's obliged to make every face different, every personality different, every set of thoughts and dreams and fears and complexes different. Nonetheless, it is the same presence. And it's you and it's me and it's all of us. And it's not just our circle. It's all our brothers and sisters around the planet. And it's not just the people. It's all living beings. And it's not just on this planet. It can't be. It's throughout the universe and throughout time and space because linear time is only one reality tunnel 
and um, this presence through us right now is able to commune with itself throughout the universe and you just have to keep breathing because it's all very ordinary and in the front of your body to activate this now bearing in mind that once this is activated with the intention to be a vessel a channel for this universal presence amongst your brothers and sisters who will have forgotten that they are that as you would have you sometimes to be this channel the heart and therefore be able to communicate whatever you need to communicate to anybody with positive effect the heart in the front has to open and when I say that what I mean is I know you'll be hearing a beautiful little Mad Max having a beautiful little catharsis of joy with this amazing father in the background that is a joyful thing I, I would like to uh, share that with you the, the breastbone in the front it can be seen like a pair of doors opening sliding doors or a couple of doors opening to reveal the core of your chest the heart center what people call the spiritual heart meaning the core of your beauty the core of your unique beauty that you and only you throughout time and space bring to existence that's what you're here for this is what the Tao has you here for to express this and if you want and again this is only a visualization device picture it as a cluster of beautiful pink sapphires and rose quartzes and amethyst and rubies and garnets and so on and so forth surrounded by mythical flowers uh, you know the honeysuckle jasmine french panny kind of family but otherworldly they're so amazingly beautiful in their smell and they're, they're all kind of rosy colors and there's a beautiful rosy goldy glow coming off it and it's warm and um, it is just the essence of goodness it's the essence of kindness it's the essence of caring it's the essence of authenticity it's the essence of beauty and of courage of nobility and of all the human qualities that we all love and that is now radiating freely from you this is love it is radiating freely from you to all sentient beings especially everyone in our circle and beyond to everyone that there is there are no limits and this includes the people who are doing the weirdest things on this planet at the moment even the people who are doing the things that you disapprove of and detest the very most and we all know who I mean and we are together radiating this uh, collective this synergy of heart she simultaneously we each of us and collectively are open and receiving the same quality from all sentient beings and especially all sentient beings who are actively consciously sending at this moment and you can be sure there will be many around the planet at this point and beyond this planet and all we have to do is keep breathing in and breathing out and hold the image of the, the vision um, which kind of goes out through this etheric web to all sentient beings of everybody smiling not the smile of cruelty not the smile of triumph over others not that smile, no twisted smiles, the, the true pure smile of the newborn baby before anyone has had any opportunity to instill any nonsense or rubbish in its mind about anything pure, gorgeous humanity it's that smile just to see everybody on the planet and it's not a big thing, it's not that huge an idea that it couldn't happen everybody on the planet right now is smiling that innocent smile of the newborn baby delighted and overwhelmingly privileged and knowing it to be here on the planet together with the most unprecedented opportunity to collectively create 
or shepherd in an era of such magnificence that it is indescribable and it's possible when you take things to one extreme you can uh, shepherd them to the other extreme quite easily it's the yin and the yang so even without trying to believe it because that just wastes energy just get the picture of everyone on the planet right now dropping the hostility and the fear and the greed and the got to look after my own and forget everyone else dropping all those uh, illusory yet nonetheless really quite irksome barriers to love and just allowing what everybody really wants this love just allowing this love and seeing it as a a a, a ubiquitous vapor a mist of rose gold glowing sparkling with light that covers the entire surface of this planet and of every planet where there is life so that every being within this beautiful rose gold mist is bathed in it and healed by it and reminded intrinsically of their real mission to spread the joy not the pain and in that light to be compassionate towards the poor people who misguidedly have elected to be the vessels of pain um, because it's a horrible role to have to play and yet the yin and the yang of things has required it it seems however that doesn't mean it has to remain in that uh, constellation and uh, to just uh, up the smile factor a few degrees in itself could do miracles of uh, healing for everybody so just seeing that the hearts of everybody on the planet just at this moment don't try and believe it just see it just letting go of all the horribleness and opening up again to the beautiful love that we have all felt and um, and in that the, a, a soothing like a healing balm that not only affects the way we treat each other on uh, a geopolitical level or a kind of a fighting level a military level whatever but even financially even financially even to get the flow of money moving around the world so that everybody's feeling a little bit better off by it all than not and and that somehow with that more sensitivity and love to the, what's around us that that will naturally translate into more people naturally collaborating focusing their incredible ingenuity on finding ways to offset the uh, pernicious effect we've had on, on the environment and it's really rather urgent now and um, and that we come together in celebration rather than war yeah that we come together in celebration uh, to celebrate our collective humanity it's all possible you know all possible just see that and just see everybody the Chinese the Russians the Americans the everybody else in between uh, the rich people, the poor people, everybody dancing together in a beautiful circle dance like Zorba the Greek and you know the one and and now everyone's sitting down because it was a great dance, we're all a little bit dizzy and high from it and uh, coming to and not forgetting it though feeling changed by it knowing that whatever you have to communicate to anybody that's a good idea and that will benefit them you'll be able to do so easily and effectively now that you'll almost not realize that you did it because that's the best kind of communication and the uh, time is nearly upon us to come into the so-called everyday waking state uh, whereupon we will do a little Q&A session uh, next week the um, theme that I am challenging myself with is um, being confident in your communication with someone who's resistant um, with whom it behooves you to part company or negotiate a radical change of conditions um, you know like you've got to leave somebody or change the basis of your relationship dramatically and it's going to be scary to think of so we'll give we'll be doing energy for that kind of thing it doesn't mean that I'm assuming you've got that going on but you will at some point so it will help for that and um, whether it's in your family or personal, your social, professional, whatever life. 
and now wriggle your fingers and wriggle your toes, wriggle your ears and wriggle your nose, flutter your eyelids, open your eyes, embrace this amazing illusion of the 10,000 things and Sue Ducrew will tell us what to do in terms of doing the Q and A dance. Hello. Hello. Did I ask you, did I rustle or make noise? Was the sound okay this week? I was just about to do a massive round of applause. There was no rustling. Hooray, hooray, hooray. <laughs> Thank you. As I was explaining to Sue, we dis I discovered the reason for that because I've just gone and got this blue mic. You know, they're the like, industry standard for webcasting and that, those big silver balls with the red light on. It's a good mic. Um, but I realised it wasn't even the mic. What it was is I was using those telephone earpieces that have got the mic on them, you know, for hands-free, because they're just easier to stick in my computer bag with my proper cans. And it was that that was making the rustling noise, silly barefoot. <laughs> well, I'm highly delighted to be sorted out, because I've actually reached the end of a webinar without being, being deafened. <laughs> Oh, good. I'm glad. I felt really horrible about that. Yeah. Well, that's a treat. Okay. Uh, we have no questions as yet. So uh, if you have a burning question that you've been harboring for some weeks now, uh, now is the time to ask it. And to do that, just type your question into the box um, or click the blue circle with the yellow hand and the green arrow. And then I will see a little yellow hand waving at me next to your name and I'll know it's to you. And I can then put you through to Doc. So, uh, Thank you, Sue. So we have a question from Kev here who says, yes. having a lot of shit at work, read the whole performance process. How do I ride this out? Uh, I wish I knew more of what you, what you actually meant. Uh, like people are criticizing your performance or, uh, or or telling you it's not good enough or you yourself are feeling the nerves of having to perform and not feeling up to it. Um, Kev, I think, Kev yeah. Says it's, it's criticism. He's being criticized. Okay, look, we can look at this from many. Is this Bubbly? Bubbly yes. Jack? Yeah. Hello, dear Bubbly. Um, so, my friend, I'll tell you the. the um, the, the the different angles, right? The others at work are uh, also the Buddha or the Tao um, in disguise. And they're there as outward manifestations of various aspects of your own psyche that's criticizing you without you realizing probably. But those inner voices that do you down, like, hey, you're not doing that good enough, you should be better at this, hey, you should be better, you're not good enough. Um, they're out there just mirroring what you're doing to yourself without realizing it. This, I'm not saying this is the truth, it's just saying, take, let's assume this, it's a stance to adopt. So you go, hey, thank you, Buddha, in this horrible person disguise um, for that. I get it. Thank you. Thank you. All right, I get what I'm doing. Thank you for showing me that. Bless you. Now, that in itself dispels some of the weird static on an energetic level. Then you look and say, okay, is there anything in what these people are saying? Um, like actually constructive that I could take and go, okay, well this detail or that detail I could improve on or change or whatever, um, or not. And that's also useful to go through the process and find out that there isn't anything to change as well. And you kind of thank them for that in your heart. Oh yeah, when I said thank them, I don't mean actually go out and say thank you, Buddha. I mean keep it in your heart, you know, in your mind, do it in your mind. Um, and then remembering your intention. So. Your overall intention, as I understand you, and I could please forgive me if I'm being uh, uh, presumptuous in saying this, is you're a man who has seen the light and understands the chi and are developing ways to get people to realize that uh, by moving the chi around through qigong and what have you, different ways of seeing, they will improve their lot immensely and life will become more fun for them and therefore by extension for you because everyone's happier that way. That seems to me to be your underlying drive and you'll express that through whatever you do. So during in your, your work so-called, you know, your job thing that you're, where you're they're paying you for your time, uh, you're still there uh, for that reason whether that's what they're getting or whether, whether they think they're getting that or not. You're infusing all your work with that, with that intention. So you remind yourself of that and you ask yourself if you could, if you could uh, marry the intention even more 
through the work. So could you in infuse your work more with that intention? You then also bear in mind that all of this is just the Tao moving you around. You also have got to ask yourself what intention do you have for yourself work-wise over the next months, uh, month, six months, year, whatever. Um, and, and it might be that you are really wanting a different environment to be in, I don't know. And that therefore you would then go, okay, so this is all the Tao opening that up for me. It's giving me the, the friction I need to get out of here. Or it's or and or and, and, and the final thing, because I've been going about this for ages, um, that you tell yourself, I well, I give you the whole thing. It's from the the Chigungo. Um, I, I channel the peace and the power of the dove, you know, because the dove is a beautiful, a very ferocious fighter, but also a beautiful white piece, lovely, elegant, and gorgeous, uh, pure, pure, that's the word. Um, I channel the peace and power of the dove, and everything I do, I do with grace and love, and that's why I turn everything to my advantage, including this. I turn this to my advantage, I do. And that sort of affirmation you give yourself, and it will then turn to your advantage, providing you, of course, stick with the, the grace and the, the love of it in it all. And uh, I think, as I said, I could go on for ages, but that would be my instant uh, advice to you, sir. And what an honour it is to give you advice. Okay, a couple of uh, comments for you here, Stephen. Julie says, I would love to actually launch forward. I would love for that to be part of our energy today. It's one thing to understand this energy and another to immerse into it from a difficult point. Thanks so much. You're welcome. And, and, and Julie, the launching forward really happens by flowing backwards. Remember that with Taoism. Okay. If you want to pull weeds out of the ground, you push them in first and then pull them out because you weaken their roots like that. They come out a lot easier in the Tai Chi or boxing or whatever. If you want to push someone over, you try and pull them towards you first because then they resist that and then you can push them really easy. And it's the same. If you want to go forwards fast, go backwards fast. It's an, an old Taoist adage and I live by it and it does work. Maz says, thanks for yet another awesome class. I loved it. Oh, good. I'm delighted and honoured to have you here, Commander. And Jane says, thank you for this wonderful satsang. We are holidaying in Canada, which we have found full of smiling, kindly people in a beautiful, fair country. And so many people own happy dogs. Thank you, Tao. Dao. <laughs> <laughs> That's lovely for you. Merry Canada. Funny enough, I'm going to Canada, see? I'm so excited. That's lovely. Good on you all. In I'm Canada there, I mean. And Gabby says, thank you so much, dear Steph. I could hear every word loud and clear. With your help and wonderful books, I've now been doing this for over three years. For anyone who's new to this, it really works more and more amazingly. A few days ago, I purely saw we are all one being. I felt so connected with every molecule of life. What an incredibly beautiful image, all having the smile of the newborn baby. It's perfect for the almighty power of the doubts of multiple universes and right back to the baby itself. So moved by that. We are all the baby and all the Tao. Bright, beautiful blessings to you for your wonderful works and all the one. Thank you. That's lovely of you. and That's a lovely testimonial. And that's where the expression, the Tao loves you, baby, comes from, isn't it? And also it kind of just brings to mind how interesting it is when you remember that the Tao if you were a constant physicist looking for the Tao, which there are people doing that, you're looking for the tiniest subatomic particle imaginable, in fact beyond imaginable, the tiniest thing rather than the biggest thing. Isn't that interesting? As you would say, Stephen, that's it and that's all. Well, I'm going to say that. That's it and that's all. Thank you, Sue. Thank you, everybody who's here. Thank you, all the people who ask questions and make comments. Bless everybody. And may the magic happen. I see you next week. Lots of love to you and to your parents.